We are now live. Hello, and welcome to Small Acts Live Q&A with Leap Confronting Conflict, Rise Collective, and Fully Focused. So I will be your host tonight, alongside my co-host Dion. Um, my name is Sheree, and I am from Leap Confronting Conflict, and I will be with you for the rest of the evening. So um, just to let you guys know, we also have a guest speaker here tonight, very special guest, Mr. Lee Wei Logan, and he will be listening to our young people performing tonight and also will be asking any questions, answering any questions that are given to us, um, especially those that are on YouTube. Just want to say hi. Welcome to the welcome, welcome to the gang, should I say. Um, you can follow us on social media, and once I will talk about our organizations. I will give you the social media handles if you want to know more information about the work that we do. Um, but please send us any questions in the live chat as we go along that you may have for Leroy and we will get back to you as soon as possible to ask him directly throughout the live, okay? So please send your, your questions in the chat. Um, so um, just to let you know, Leap Confronting Conflict is a charity, a national charity with 30 years experience delivering programs to transform the way conflict is managed by adults and the young people. Um, Rise Collective is also a creative charity that works with young people to provide inspirational live events, offers mentorship and provides employment and networking opportunities across the UK and beyond. We also have Fully Focused in the Room, um, who is the UK's leading youth driven production company. And they are the founders of Million Youth Media and MYM Academy. Okay, so they support the next generation of filmmakers and underrepresented talent. So we have three organizations in the space. Um, follow us on social media at leap underscore CC, at the Rise Collective UK, and at UK Fully Focused. Okay, so I would let you know um, one thing that what I was going to say. Oh, sorry, that, um, that myself and Dion will be hosting and we also will be um, chatting to you guys on the YouTube chat. Once again, please leave your questions down below and we'll get the leeway to directly answer them. OK, so um, our special guest is the founder and chair of the Black Police Association, um, a former Metropolitan Police Officer and Sergeant and Superintendent, author of Closing Ranks, My Life as a Cop and who has recently had his life story depicted by Small Act series on the third episode called Red, White and Blue. Um, this is portrayed by John Boyega in the film and he is here in person tonight. So everyone, can we give him a massive warm welcome to Mr. Leroy Logan. Woo! Thank you. Woo! 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 <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's amazing to have you here. Boy, it's amazing to have you here. We've got so many young people in the call that want to speak to you, that want to ask questions, and that will also want to show their showcase their talent and also their creative responses that they've had to the film and to the show and your episode. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to individually introduce the young people one by one who will come up on the screen and talk to you and share their work. So um, I will get Dion to announce and introduce the first young person who will be coming up on screen. Yes, so we've given the young people um, an opportunity to create a creative response or come up with a question. And the first creative response that we're gonna um, listen to is by Aaron. So let's welcome him to the stage, everyone. <laughs> Woo! Woo! Thank you, everybody. Um, Firstly, um, I want to say hello to everyone and thank you to Leap. Thank you to, to Leroy. Um, and um, I'll be sharing a poem. Uh, but before I go into the poem, I just wanted to say watching the piece um, or watching Small Acts, it reminded me of what Malcolm X once said. Malcolm X once said, Black is beautiful. And that phrase doesn't just necessarily relate to our physicality. It, it relates to the intellect, to culture, to ways of being, ways of doing. Black is beautiful 
all round. And the character, John Boyega, who played you, demonstrated that there was a strength that you had. There was a grounding, a grounding in one's identity. And that despite what you went through, you continued on. So the piece that I've written in response to uh, to watching that um, episode is entitled Beautiful is Our Blackness. And it demonstrates, I hope, the power within Black people and Black culture. In this piece, I mention a professor I really look up to by the name of Cornel West. I promise he's not related to Kanye West. We pray for him, we pray for him. But Cornel West is a professor in America, has no relation to Kanye West, so don't worry. And uh, yeah, once again, this piece, is, this piece is entitled, Beautiful is Our Blackness. <clears throat> Humanity, Africanity. Africanity simply means African humanity. As a child, I struggle to embrace this, taught to hate this, obsessed with whiteness. In the West, demonized was blackness. So why would I want to be me? Cursed due to Africanity. However, from the West rose a sun, shining light, giving life to everyone, wielding words harder than two clenched fists, sharing a message of proud blackness. Say it loud. I'm black and I'm proud. That's what he said. Wakening, giving life to the dead. Core Neil West, that's his name, a wide gap between his two front teeth and a style as plain as my granny. Yet still, inspire me. Yes, yes he did. I had never heard a black man speak quite like him. So bold, so passionate, so confident, so beautiful, so intricate. And I'm not ashamed to mention, so black. The void left in me through the abandoning of my Africanity was, was restored. The West demonized me while West showed me that the West was wrong about me. He taught me, never allow someone else to create your song. Be like a jazz musician and create your own song. Be like the Frederick Douglasses, Sojourner Truths and Martin Luther Kings. Black people, a strong people, can give birth to queens and kings. So blackness doesn't symbolize shame, but power. Not violence, beauty. Not ugliness. Wisdom, not failure, success, definitely not stupidity. So black people, rise up, stand up tall, straighten up so you don't fall. I'll repeat what Cornel West once said, your back can't be rid when it's not bent so stand stand up for justice don't laugh when it's not funny scratch when it doesn't itch rise and shine beautiful 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 is our blackness thank you thank you guys. so next um we have a question from malik is malik here just to clarify no can we hear malik oh. okay great i'm here <laughs> hello hello sorry about that um thank you for having me and thank you for being here um I'm gonna get straight into the question so I don't bore anyone. Uh, first and foremost, uh, I wrote this down. 
there are many ways to affect change in the system. And I wanted to know why you chose to do um, being a frontline officer opposed to a politician or something else within the community and why you chose a frontline officer as a way to be the change you want to see. Well, um, it was um, not my first choice. Uh, my actual first choice after my degree in applied biology was to be a scientist. So I worked at the Royal Free Hospital in Hampstead for three and a half years. And so I thought my career was charted towards science and possibly doing medicine. It mm -hmm. was just, I was caught on the blind side by some local officers from Hampstead Police Station because they used to use the Royal Free Sporting Facilities. So they would use our gym, our sports hall, our swimming pool. And, you know, they'd be in the bar afterwards. And I got to know them personally, not knowing they were police officers. And when they did declare themselves as officers, I, I saw the human side before I saw the enforcement side. Uh, mm -hmm. And that reduced a lot of my perceptions about police, because at the time, I was pretty anti-police because um, I was um, brought up in Islington in London mm -hmm. and the sus law in the 60s and 70s was very draconian, even more draconian than police powers now. Because you could be arrested on suspicion that you're about to commit an arrestable offence. So we used to call the police the thought police because they could read our minds that we're about to commit an offence. And um, we we'll call them all sorts of other names as well. Yeah, I'm so sure. You <laughs> um, so, and they're not far removed from what they were called now. So I was very anti-police, but when I um, got to talk to them and they were saying that there's a big recruiting drive for people of African, Caribbean and Asian origins to join. And I, it was shortly after the, the Brixton riots and the Scarman report, which recently celebrated its 40 years. It was basically, I, I started to get this calling. And then this voice in my head was saying, this is something you have to try. And uh, so it caught me on the blind side. And there was various other things that was reinforcing it. And the, the most crucial thing was uh, one of my best friends from school. Uh, his name is Lee John. He used to, he sings in a group called Imagination. He's been doing that for many decades. And um, his mother was a, a community liaison officer. She used to work with the police. Um, she used to run the uh, West Indian Community Center in Turnpike Lane. And she, she used to work with Harrogate police officers to, to try and build bridges between police and the community. And she, um, her name is Jessie Stevens, and Je Aunt Jessie said, Lee Wright, I think you need to respond to this call that you got, because I can't see you doing science for the rest of your life. And, um, and I was, I said, okay, I'll, I'll apply. But some of you might have seen the small axe piece that yeah. while I was applying, my dad was beaten up by police officers uh, badly. And those of you who saw the film will see that my father was beaten black and blue and that was no ex exaggeration and uh, I thought no way I could join but when you have that calling and you have a and I was driven by a vision that was very clear that I, I could make changes from within and even though I love my dad and he was an a, amazing role model together with my mother I just had to respond to that call and even my um, boss at the Royal Free even said listen I think you need to make this step. I'll keep your job open for six months. If it doesn't work out, you can always come back. Mm. And uh, well, I, I stepped into a very hostile environment. It was totally different from the Royal Free Hospital, even though it's public service as, you, as, as before, but it wasn't um, a very congenial um, culture because it was very, well, it didn't celebrate diversity. It didn't really understand it. Uh, it was very militaristic, testosterone-driven, macho culture, which um, it, it, it took a lot of getting used to. And in fact, 
in closing, the first 10 years, I was really questioning my sanity. Why would I do this? Mm. Why would I take myself out my comfort zone of science to go and join the police? Knowing my experience, knowing what they did to my father, but I just had to make that step. And in my book, the first line, it actually says, your worst nightmare could be your biggest breakthrough. And it was that. So hopefully that answers your question. It did. It did a lot. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you, Libra. That was amazing. Um, so we're going to move on to a next creative piece from Xavier. Yeah. Hey, Libra. Hey, everyone. Um, so this is a drawing. You know, not going to be long. <laughs> I don't know if it's going to be long. <laughs> um, so I don't know if you can see it. Is this good? Probably can't see it that well. I'll go, go closer. Yeah, we can see it. Amazing. So um, it's a cartoon really about the relationship that I saw through the film with you, Leroy, and your father and trying to break through like a world that you didn't see existing at the time. And like, there was a line that said like, I wish the world could burn or something in order to make a new, in order to make a new one, a new, a new path. And I just, you know, I thought about the bird because the bird is something that you want to be desperately to be free and that there are other birds holding it down. And, um, you know, being horrific to it. And, yeah, that's what it brought to me, to be honest. Um, yeah. Can I have another look at it, please? Yeah. Okay. And so, so that's the main bird at the top, and then these other birds below? Yeah, the other birds are sort of at the burning, okay. the burning ground. And right. then the bird is trying to get to this new new place okay. of freedom, really. Wow. Yeah, that's really that is thought provoking, <laughs> to say the least. It really um that's pretty deep. Are yeah. you that way normally, Xavier? Yeah, I'm quite deep. <laughs> um yeah. Yeah, I was I just really, um, I've been watching a lot of content um, like Small Axe and I find it really powerful and I just think it's very, it's very thought provoking with what's happening now with the police and the distrust that a lot of people have, but also the not the other side, which is not distrust, which is wanting to find a middle ground. So I think that's interesting. Um, yeah, no, no, no well, just just to say that you know i, I really appreciate um that drawing um if i i'm really appreciating everything that um everyone's doing um and I, and I think um steve mcqueen would be so proud to know that um so many young people have identified with his work and the impact it's having to raise everyone's awareness about the issues and um I, I, I'm definitely going to pass on this link to, to his executive producer and um, make sure he sits down and watch this because I, I know these, this is what floats his boat. You know, he wants to see creativity and content that you wouldn't normally see. And, and I think it's, it's to be um, commended that you, you, you are... Um, wanting to do this, you know, there's a natural desire, you're not forcing yourself to do this. And, um, and, and I must admit, it encourages me that the, the world can be a much better place because young people are looking at it in such a uh, fresh way. And um, it, it resonates with a conversation I was having with my youngest son, um, he's, uh, he's 28. And he's into videography and photography as well. And he was telling me, even though he doesn't class himself as young <laughs> anymore, uh, but 
he he says that young people have, have got such a fresh approach about things that is totally different to my generation. And um, I must admit, I, I said, well, yeah, I think you're right. So this is just an example of that. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. That was really powerful. Thank you, both of you. Um, and we're going to move on to Junior to ask a question. My internet's gone. <laughs> um, I'll be honest, I can't entirely think of one at the moment. Honestly, I've, after everything that I've heard, I'm just literally in awe of everything. Um, I'm so sorry. It's like, no worries, we'll just move on um, to Sheree from the YouTube. Thank you. So, Leroy, we've got a couple of people who have um, asked a question from YouTube. Just before I ask the question, I just wanted to uh, mention that today is the anniversary of George Floyd's death. And I just wanted to acknowledge it on this um, channel, just so that we can just remember his presence and the impact his death has had on everybody um, and the work that has happened since then to enforce anti-racism. Um, so just wanted to acknowledge that. Um, we've got a question from somebody, and it is, do you believe positive discrimination in all levels should be pushed further in institutions such as the police to potentially reduce a lack of diversity within major UK no national sectors? Um, in, a, in a word, no. Um, the reason being, uh, I believe in a meritocracy, people to be judged on their merits, but also for a level playing field. So that means everyone should be brought up to the same level for an assessment center or an examination or whatever, but they judge their merits. Now, how do you get to that level playing field? Well, it might be that you can target and support and nurture talent that might not be up to that same level and through a post process of positive action to identify them and assist them to build up their portfolio or their skills and experience so that they can come up to the same level as their majority culture colleagues. And then they can be assessed on merit and not on quotas. And the reason why I say that is because I have seen where quotas and positive discrimination has actually been counterproductive. Um, if you look at um, America, all the various police departments invariably have black police chiefs through the quota positive discrimination system. But you still have police killings. You still have people being um, treated like animals. Um, even um, the officer that killed George Floyd he has a black police chief. Well, he's actually a police chief of color. I think he's um, um, Mexican and uh, another heritage. I can't remember exactly, but he's a person of color and, but it still happens. So ju just having black police chief or those going up the ranks just because of the color of their skin does not mean the change that you want to see. So it's not just about the person being of color in any rank or grade, it's about their attitude. And I'll give you an example. When I joined the police, I made it known that I'm a black man who happens to be a cop and not a cop who happens to be black. Because as a black man joining the police service with my beliefs and values, I integrated it. I integrated and I didn't feel a need to adopt the norms and values of the culture. If I said I was a cop who happens to be black, there's a greater chance of me just assimilating and adopting those norms and values of the culture. And I have seen black officers and other minority groups, those officers can sometimes be even more heavy handed on their own people just to try and fit in with their white majority culture colleagues. And so they're part of the problem. And that attitude can create more barriers because I know 
young people um, saying that to me. I, I've been running, uh, I was involved in setting up a charity um, that developed a, a leadership program. It was the Black Police Association Charitable Trust. And we ran a leadership program. It is now known as Voyage Youth. You can Google it. It's still um, doing some great work. I'm no longer the chair, but I, I stood down last year. But for the last 20 odd years, they have been running the leadership program and they always, and the young people always talk about a sense of being over policed and underprotected. And sometimes black officers are even more tough on them and heavy handed. And it's a way of officers really dropping their identity and assimilating into the culture. So that's one of the issues that quotas can do. They can just force you into a situation you don't know really to perform that role to the best of your ability because maybe you're not, it's not that right time for you, but because they're pushing you through because the color of your skin, you just have to do it. And, and sometimes you can be less effective as you go up the ranks. Uh, myself, I only went up the ranks when I knew I was ready to be judged on my merits. And I didn't want to be promoted just because I'm black. And, and unfortunately, the culture will say, well, you only got in the police because you're black. You only got promoted because you're black. They say that anyway, but I know that I had to be judged on my merits, just like every other officer here in the UK. But in America, they've adopted positive discrimination and quotas and it hasn't helped. So that's my stance. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to ask one more question from YouTube and then we'll go back to the young people in the call. Um, one of the questions from Joshua J is, did you ever seriously consider leaving the force? And if so, why didn't you leave? Well, I did consider it uh, several times. I remember that the, the first um, few weeks at Hendon where the, um, well, I did my foundation course at Hendon Training School and I I couldn't believe the casual racism, the N word, the W word. And it, it, it really, I couldn't even eat the food. <laughs> I hated the food. It was like the worst school meals you could think of. Uh, I lost so much weight. And um, I thought, why, as I said before, I really was questioning my sanity. Why would I still pursue this purpose? And, um, so I remember several times when I thought, I've got to, I can't do, deal with this. And I remember we, I'd go home for weekends and um, my wife, Brettel, uh, would see me losing weight. And I said, listen, I, I think I've got to give this a miss. <laughs> and she said, no, you ain't, you can't give up. You just have to keep going. Because uh, she was supporting me from the get go. Because uh, she's from Nigeria. So she saw black police officers. So for her, it, it, it wasn't an issue to be an officer. Maybe if um, I had a wife who was brought up in the UK and they, they got a negative stance towards policing, it, it, she might have had a totally different attitude. So that was one of the first instances where I thought, well, you know, I don't know if I can survive this, but I, I then said, well, you know, keep going, keep going. And uh, I got through the foundation course and uh, it, it, I, I had a role model in at Hendon, um, he was, we have class captains and deputy class captains. And I remember Tom Kelly was um, the class captain. He was a Sanders instructor. So he's, but he was very humble with it. But he taught me how to bull my shoes. They were, they look like a mirror and how to iron your shirts properly and the seams in your trousers and all that sort of stuff. He, he, he gave me a masterclass in <laughs> how to survive Hendon. And um, so he, he really helped me through. And we were about the same age as well. And we were married, we had children. That's what, well, we had, we had our child each. And uh, even though they were very young. And uh, I remember we, um, we had a long-term friendship. In fact, it's been rekindled again through the small acts because he loved the film. Um, but when I went to Islington, my first police station, I knew the area, I knew the culture, I knew the people. 
and uh, I even knew the Arsenal because it's my uh, local football team. So um, it was home for me, you know. Yeah, I, I wish I got Champions League, but anyway, kind of everything. Um, and um, I remember when I went to Islington, they said, don't go on a relief. That's the worst relief. They, they hate um, probationers. If you're a probationary constable in your first two years, they treat you like, uh, they used to call us sprogs, which is uh, a, a, a very, very negative term to say. Basically, it's like being a skivvy. It's like being, you just do what you're told and don't say anything or, you know, you, 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 you'll um, reap their wrath, as it were. And um, the worst team, they put me on it. And I had the worst reporting sergeant. In fact, it was so consistent. He hated everyone. Whether you're black, white, female, whatever. He didn't like you. Um, and I thought, if I can get through the first two years, I can get through the, the next 28, which uh, I was able to do. But there was um, another big um, challenge for me. Um, well, there's various challenges, but the one that really comes to mind is when um, I, I was investigated for a trumped-up charge for um, uh, and a hotel expenses claim against my own, orga my own organization, um, the Black Police Association. And um, it was all because myself and my uh, two other colleagues from the, the BPA gave evidence at the McPherson inquiry into the death of Stephen Lawrence to say that we were, in, to say that the Met Police was introduced to racist. And we knew we, when you put your head above the parapet, you're going to be on someone's target. So we weren't surprised we were going to be um, investigated. And this was about 2002. So I've, I've been in the job um, uh, almost 20 years at that stage. And I remember um, they, they went to uh, put me on a misconduct um, trial. Uh, and it might go into Crown Court. And it happened to other colleagues. And I remember it was trial by media, all the papers knew about it. And I remember my, my youngest son, and the one I referred to before, Miles, um, he was 10 at the time. He said, um, um, Dad, are you going to prison? And uh, that really hurt me. And I thought, wow, my son is asking me if I'm going to prison over this. Fortunately, no, I didn't. In fact, it didn't go to a misconduct trial or even Crown Court. In fact, the Met Police had to compensate me heavily and um, uh, my reputation was intact. And uh, my son was pleased I wasn't in prison. In fact, I'm not too sure if he, <laughs> he might have said, oh, we won't see him for a few months, but no, he, 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 he was pleased that uh, it didn't happen. And, uh, but at that stage, I thought, why am I putting myself through this? You know, and, um, and I, had, as I said, I've been in the job almost 20 years, but, you know, I still push through. I just, I just needed to get through and to, to know that no one could derail me and, and, and force me off track, uh, regardless of their personalities or the prejudices. And I knew excellence was the best deterrent. I was going to show my excellence, regardless of what they thought. I was going to come out smiling with a joy in my heart and no one was going to take that away from me. Um, Thank you. You're okay. Thank you. We're going to pass it back to Dion now. We'll introduce the next young person. So thank you, Lewis. So next we have a creative piece from Brittany. Hi guys, I'm Brittany. Um, I am a writer poet, but I also like to dabble into different art forms. So this is a, a drawing that I did and I'll, I'll explain it while I'm showing. So I'm gonna share, share screen, if that's okay, Shuri. Um, can you see that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, cool. So, so my initial idea for this was like to draw a drawing, like a child's drawing. Um, and to just imagining like a child who's just um, has an admiration and just has, you know, looks at a, a loved one or, like, or maybe just a police officer if like, like they're their hero um, and just seeing that childlike innocence, but also um, to go next. 
Um, can you see that? Next picture. But also just um, showing how that hope is taken away and how that hope is destroyed um, because of the, the, the structure of um, the institution and how much rebuilding still needs to be done. And um, one thing I got from watching the film was how, oh, okay, sorry, can't see the next picture. Hold on, let me stop screen share and then try again. Um, okay, cool. Da, 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 da. Cool, sorry. So yeah, I'm just seeing how, um, how much rebuilding that needs to be um, done. And one thing I got from watching the film was how um, I felt like there was a lot of hope in in your character i don't know if it's if, if that was true but despite you know the the struggle and going against you know what your family wanted as well and the, their own experiences um with the police force but there was just this glimmer of hope still inside um the character that i saw um you um and I was just like, that's just so beautiful. And it just reminded me of a child and how children have this still, this little hope still lingering with inside of them, despite the hardships. So I, you know, ripped up the paper and crumpled it up and then also stuck it back together, like just to show that rebuilding, but also just, you can see the, um, the devastation and the hardship in it all. Um, hope that made sense, but yeah. Wow, yeah, that, that that's lovely. Um, can, can I chip in straight away, Cherie? Okay. Yes, please. Yes. Yeah. Um, it, it, yeah. Thank you very much for that. It, it, again, very powerful. Um, there's this uh, Japanese term. Uh, uh, please forgive me if I get the pronunciation wrong, but I think it's kinsui. And it, 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 is that right? Oh, can she, yeah. Is that when, yeah, I think I know what you're talking about. When, when you can create beauty out of brokenness. Yeah. And um, I, I'm actually, I'm, I'm part of a, um, a charity called that, um, run by an amazing guy called Patrick Regan. And a lot of it um, came out of his um, challenges on mental health which he freely admits, and um, he's written books on it. And he, and he um, that charity is so timely because especially what's happened with COVID and the challenges that people have faced and some of it alone and in their brokenness, they've lost that sense of hope. And I think hope is such an important spark in our lives. If we lose hope, so many things seem hope well not just hopeless meaningless as well and um that your your, your pictures uh Brittany um really just resonated how the out of the brokenness can come real beauty and strength and greater possibilities and I I think that's where um, we need to help one another because um, while we're in that broken state, if we don't really talk to each other and communicate and be responsible for each other, we, we can walk by and I'm not say anything and that person loses all sense of hope and, and it can have devastating circumstances. So, it's, it's really important that we recognize even how George Floyd, how he, how he, as far as I was concerned, it, it was like a lynching because it was a cold, callous killing from an officer who actually swore an allegiance, very similar to what I swore as a police officer to protect and serve. And I was, when I saw that, video 
literally within hours of it happening. One of my cousins sent it to me from the States. Um, I, I just couldn't believe it. And, um, but his brokenness has, has brought so much beauty and strength in the world. And I remember his daughter was interviewed. I think his daughter was about six or seven at the, at the time. And she said, her father's gonna change the world. And I think that's the, the beauty of George Floyd is his legacy and how he's brought a, a sense of beauty. And, and I think it picks up on the first spoken word around the beauty of, of being black and not feeling self-loathing that we see in, in so many communities. And in our brokenness, in, 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 we can be seen as beautiful as we emerge from that broken state. So um, I could go on more, but I just wanted to say it, it really touched my heart, really. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Um, we're going to have a question from Sharif next. Hi. Hi. Um, my question to um, Leroy is, um, do, you, um, do you think the, um, the criminal justice system is stacked against young black men? Yes, um, I do. And the reason why I say that is, um, again, the spoken word, um, please forgive me. What, what was the name of the young man who did that smoke, uh, spoken word? Aaron. Aaron, was it? Aaron. Yeah, Aaron, Aaron um, touched on it. Um, and how black men are perceived. And I saw it from within the police service and the wider justice system, because I'd go to court oh, right. and even going to the prisons. And you could see how black men are feared. Um, not because they're menacing or they're violent. I think in a lot of ways, they're feared because of their potential and what, what they pose for people who want the status quo and the white majority to the, even the white supremacy piece. Uh, which we've seen the world over. And um, you see it playing out on the streets on a day-to-day -day basis. I, I, I used to, when I was a supervisor in the Met, as a sergeant inspector, you know, that, that's the first two ranks of, of promotion from constable to sergeant, from sergeant to inspector. And they are normally the first and second line supervisors on the streets. And I would be, again, public enemy number one of my colleagues when I would see my officers being extremely heavy handed. Um, and the disparities between how they deal with black men, very heavy handed, handcuffs, tear spray, uh, not so much tasers in those days. They weren't around as much as they are now. But, and I'd say, well, why are you being so heavy handed with that person? especially if they had um, any sort of mental health issue, uh, they would treat them like literally they were animals. And I, I said, no, you don't have to do that. You can, you can work with them and, and see them not just a potential prisoner, but see them as a potential patient. They need support. And um, you, you've seen it on how stop and search, you're nine times more likely to be stopped if you're black than you're white. Um, you're, if you're arrested, you're more than likely to be handcuffed. Well, even in a stop and search, they handcuff you now before um, the um, arrest is made or even the search is made. Um, all that shows fear as far as I'm concerned. And, and, and I think a lot of it is a sense of shame that officers white majority of uh, culture officers feel, and, and they want to keep the control, and they want to show their supremacy, and it plays itself out in that way. And then you see it further down the justice system, you're two to three times more likely to be 
arrested and charged and kept in custody, then given bail. And then when you go before the courts, you have a higher propensity of getting a more severe charge. And even when you go into the prisons, you have less access to privileges and um, rehabilitation programs. And it goes on and on and on. And I think a lot of this is residual from slavery. Because uh, black men were feared in slavery. And it's, that's why they were treated in such an inhuman way. And I'm not just talking about lynching, but all sorts of undermining the masculinity of black men. And putting that up as this is what happens to you as a black man if you come against the white man. And that residual has gone on. And I'm not into the perpetual slave syndrome, but I know you can't have 400 years of trafficking black people from Africa to the Caribbean and America and certain parts of Europe without there being residual. I mean, we know that a lot of organizations, institutions, even educational establishments are set up on slavery. So the residual is there. The systemic failures, the institutional racism is all residual from slavery, imperialism, colonialism, and what we have now, a certain type of freedom. We don't have total freedom, but it's a lot better than a lot of other countries. But it doesn't mean that we think, oh, that's okay. We need to keep pressure on to ensure that regardless of your background, your culture, your gender, your lifestyle, you have a human right to be treated with respect and dignity. And if there is a breach, then there, those officers should be held to account, whether it's internal regulations, uh, misconduct hearings, or even going to the court. Um, as recently as yesterday, I, I wrote the forward for a, a report by the Criminal Justice Alliance um, around the excessive use of Section 60 of the C Criminal Justice and Public Order Act. And that looks into, uh, that's the legislation that an authorizing officer gives officers the right to stop and search youngsters or people, anyone, uh, without reasonable grounds. Because the authorizing officer, which used to be a superintendent, I used to do them in when I was in the Met, it's now reduced two ranks to inspector. And there's a disproportionate use of Section 60s, and not just in a finite area where they carry out the roadblocks and the stops without reasonable grounds, but also borough-wide. Sometimes you might see it on Insta or Twitter that Haringey is now subject to a borough-wide Section 60. And they're going really tough and hard, especially on young Batman. Now, those sort of things has to stop. And, and I've actually um, agreed that they, you know, you abuse a, a law, you lose it. Because that's part of the reform process. And um, I'm hoping that we, we are going to at least have um, some legislative reforms because police need to be reformed so they can't carry on with these cases. And we, we, we had a case um, of a young man called Rashan Charles in Hackney in 2017. Yeah. You need to be careful. <laughs> Sorry, what was that? Sorry. Apologies. Sorry, someone just ran in front of my car. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Oh, okay, okay. Sorry. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, yeah. There was a young man called Rashan Charles. Um, you might yeah. have seen, uh, there's a YouTube video that's going around. Uh, they strangled his neck. Yeah, yeah uh, where the officer ran in after him in a shop. It was in Hackney, just off the Kings and Road. And he, the officer brought in a chokehold. Well, he brought him down to the ground, brought in a chokehold and put his hand in his mouth to try and get drugs out of his mouth. One, the officer is not trained to take drugs out of anyone's mouth. Two, a chokehold is not an authorised hold. We're not trained to do that. Um, and three, if someone decides to swallow something, 
You don't treat them as a prisoner. You treat them as a patient. Call a doctor, a paramedic, whatever. Well, that young man died. And um, in, it, in the YouTube video that, that's uh, been shown around, his uncle, his granduncle actually, Rod Charles was the chief inspector. And I worked with him in the Met on various things. So even he said that death was avoidable. So when people say, oh, George Floyd is only in America, we've had our own George Floyd. And that was Rashan Charles. Um, and that officer um, got away with it, as far as I'm concerned. I, I've been on record to say that death was avoidable. That officer was carrying out unlawful hold and actions, and he should have been held to account for, for real. And, I, it, and I, I, I know that officer, well, I won't say I know, but I believe strongly that if that officer was running after a white man, he wouldn't have brought him down like that. He wouldn't have chokehold him like that. He wouldn't have put his hand in his mouth like that. I think it's because he was a black man. And I don't say that lightly because I've seen when officers see red after a chase, whether it's a foot chase or a vehicle chase, they get the red haze and they don't know how to hold on. And I've had to pull officers off prisoners because they are just don't show a sense of proportion. And I always say to them, listen, understand, regardless of what that person's done, they still have their human rights, especially if they're in our custody. We have to be proportionate. We have to be using necessary force, not excessive force. We have to be accountable and we have to be carrying out our legal actions. And uh, that's basic human rights. So we're not asking, I'm not asking my officers to be more favorable to anyone. I'm saying treat everyone the same under the Human Rights Act. And so when I see them being excessive to black men, then I said, that's a breach of human rights. So if you want to carry on with that, don't go be my guest, but you're not going to do it on my, not on my watch, not on my team. Does that answer your question? Um, yeah, 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 definitely. definitely. Is, there, is there time for another question? Or is that you want just one question? Oh, Sorry, Sharif, right. we've got some old people who want to ask questions. Right. But thank you. All right, thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, we're going to pass to Cami for Create Peace. Hi. Um, yeah. So my my piece is a like a bit of a bit of prose, um, and it's called "They're No Longer Drowning," um, and it's basically just an attempt to articulate the journey, articulate um, sort of, yeah, where, where we're up to um, for as many people as possible. I noticed in, in the Small Axe episode there, there's a lot of relationships going on and, you know, good or bad, kind of helpful or not helpful, um, well-intentioned and badly intentioned. And I think there was a lot to unpack. Um, but yeah, just thinking about it sort of made me want to articulate it for myself and sort of this kind of what I'm about to read is uh, what came out of that. Um, so um, if everyone can, or if you can um, sort of close your eyes um, and just sort of imagine what I'm telling you. Cool. So you're drowning in the middle of a black sea, caught up in a savage storm and you're only just managing to stay afloat. And your limbs, they feel like, like driftwood as the water that you've inhaled scratches the insides of your lungs. And in the distance, you see a large yacht and you call out, but the strong winds sort of whip your voice straight from your mouth and into the harsh air, like as if it's going into the ether. But at least the yacht is closer than you think. People on the boat shout to you. They're telling you that it's fine. You're not actually drowning. And they watch you flail for a while before they eventually throw you some kiddie floats. 
They're so small that they barely squeeze past your wrists and they sort of leave you there for the night. The next morning, some people shout from the deck, why are you still out there? It hasn't occurred to them that you need someone to pull you out of the sea. Your legs are swollen and heavy and your vision is blurred. You hear someone on board far away question if you need to be pulled up. And sure enough, you notice yourself being dredged towards an immovable object. Half conscious, you're grateful when you're finally pulled onto the cold, hard deck. You're so weak that you can hear death calling for you amidst the waves, wondering where their visitor has gone. The burning water within your chest screams at you as you cough and splutter, trying to exercise it out. No one's thought to put you in the recovery position. Someone notices that you're in the way in the path of other people. Um, and they push you to one side, sort of propping your back up against uh, the barrier of the ship um, as the cold air seeps into your bones and it nestles into your marrow. You find yourself suddenly awoken by a stranger. You need to get up. You need to get up. He urgently moves you to your feet. He realizes that your ankle is swollen, probably broken. He wraps your arm, his arm around your shoulder and together you sort of hop and limp below deck. He bandages your ankle, sees that you're cold and that your lips overnight have chapped and cracked. He asks a passerby for the remains of their half empty cup of coffee. He grabs the cup, puts it to your lips and you have no choice but to drink the leftovers though you can't help but grimace in your mind at it having been so close to someone else's lips. At least it warms your toes a little bit. You're fed scraps from an unseen banquet table until you're strong enough to build a small table of your own. You stumble around until your limping gait is almost as solid as an average man's stride. Every now and again, you look up to see the higher decks, towering far beyond where your stout neck can give you the perspective to comprehend. Every now and again, some other people wash up on deck in the months that follow. Sometimes you have the strength to help them, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you're too busy, too tired, too overworked. Sometimes you wish they would help themselves. But whoever makes it through their first night is welcome to eat at your humble table. But why isn't your table as big as the banquet table you've heard so many stories about? The one where all the original yacht passengers eat? It will take you forever to build enough scrap timber to make a table half that big. Why do the passengers on the lower deck of the boat look at you with distaste? Their building contempt emanates from them like steam from a boiling pot. Why is the yacht, why is the yacht, sorry, why is the yacht so tired? Why is it tiered? It entices you yeah. with dreams, yeah. make it up the rigging. Uh, leave it work. Sorry, Cammy. Oh, you sorry, on yeah, yeah. There you go. Um, sorry, yeah. Why is the yacht so high up? Why is it tiered? It entices you with dreams to make it up the rigging. But these dreams can make your working reality so dizzyingly, dizzyingly painful that you almost throw yourself out to sea once again in frustration. Some people do throw themselves. Some people throw at others in an effort to eliminate the competition. For that matter, why aren't you ever taught to swim? Why does no one ever think of changing course back towards land? Surely there are plenty of resources there, enough for everyone. Um, you guys can open your eyes and I just wanna finish with them. Um, no one is born drowned and very few people are born on the yacht. Um, so how did all of those people get there? Uh, yeah, that's the piece. Thank you, Cammy. That was amazing. So powerful. So powerful. How long did that take you to uh, to write? Uh, not not long. Not long. I think. 
I don't know. <laughs> uh, it sort of fell out of my head a little bit, uh, like thinking out, out loud. Okay. Mm. Uh, was, it, was there a, any significant or, or uh, intentional, it was there an intentionality behind it was, or was it? Yeah, I was, I was sort of trying to figure out a lot of things. Um, I think I'm, I'm, I'm so curious in a way how we as black people are treated, but then I'm also just as curious about sometimes how we treat each other. Um, I think, like I said, the thing with small acts are all the different relationships, like there's so much going on. And I think that there's definitely something to be said that, um, especially what you were saying with discrimination and with, um, especially sort of with what, I wanna say Andre, but I don't wanna get his name wrong. Aaron, sorry, Aaron was saying with his poetry, not Andre. Um, like there's there's a lot to unpack there's a lot there and i think it was it was it was me trying to articulate what i've seen um and what i've heard and how unfair things can be but how also how simple things could be if we maybe asked ourselves questions from different angles and if we put our efforts towards different things or try something new. I think um, other people have quoted people and, uh, and so will I, I think. I, I'm not gonna say it's Albert Einstein because I've read it online and I feel like you can read things online, think it's from someone and it's not. But um, there's that quote of like, the definition of stupidity is trying the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. And I think that there is a way in which we've seen a lot of this before. And a lot of it has kind of not borne any fruit and yet, we're doing it again and it's like cool um or we could do something new and we could listen and we can have these conversations and we can question one another and we can question ourselves and we can think like what is what is this what is this thing that we've all found ourselves on board of like and how how did we get here and how can we justify being here, how can we justify people being born into this and dying because of it when it's not where we're from and it's definitely not where we're trying to get to. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that explained anything, <laughs> um, but yeah. No, no, it, it, it's very, yeah. Um, I, I, are you people normally this deep? <laughs> I just wondered. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I do want to say as well, sorry, is yeah. that um, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of stuff there um, where I think I'm hoping that people can put themselves in the place of, of every sort of person that could be in that world. So as much as you can put yourself in a place of, and it's up to you sort of where you decide to put yourself, but you can be that person who's drowned or the person who's shouting from the deck or the person who's helping or whatever. But I think it's important to remember that at, at all across our lives will probably be at least you know we'll probably be one of those people or all of those people at least once in our lives um I think that's an important part of the conversation as well yeah sorry Carry yeah. On. <laughs> no, great, great. Uh, actually uh, what it brought uh to mind was um uh, earlier today I, I I did a an event for a corporate organization and um one of the other speakers, um, she made uh, one of her training um, modules involves um, white managers, and she'll put put a question to them, and says, um, "How many of you stand up? If how many, if any of you would like to be treated like a black person?" And surprise, surprise, no one stands up. So she then says, well, I'll put the question to you again. Who would like to be treated like a black person? And no one does. And, and, she, and that's a powerful exercise is to say, well, listen, if you're not willing to put yourself in that position, then why do you put other people in that position? And, and um, yeah, it did. 
And I think what, what that sort of conversation will have is the term of allyship, that they have to put themselves in that person's shoes to really understand. Uh, and in fact, we, we, we in the Black Police Association, we had a, an understanding of that because our definition of black is not an assessment of color, but the shared and common experience of people of African, African Caribbean and Asian origins. So we had white members, because if they could, we, I mean, it, was, it wasn't like saying, oh, you've had a COVID jab or anything like that, or some sort of certificate. But if they said we had a shared experience because a partner is uh, black or we've got mixed heritage children or in-laws or whatever it may be, and they could really show their, um, that shared experience and walk in our shoes and understand what we were talking about and not be a saboteur or, or, or disruptive, then they could be a member. And uh, all the BPAs across the, the country have a similar um, criteria and a definition. So I think that's what we have to try and do is to get uh, our majority culture colleagues, whether it's college, work, uni, wherever we socialize, walk in our shoes and, and you'll see what we have to go through. So, you know, your, your, your pro is um, extremely powerful, especially um, talking about that immersion that we all live in and, and having to survive and stay afloat. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it, it conjures up some really vivid um, imagery. So thank you very much for that. Going to pass to Sharon. Okay, so Leeway, we have two final questions from the YouTube. Um, but quite a few familiar names, actually. So shout out to Jay Bonsu. Um, how has working within the police, I think you might have touched on this, how has working within the police informed your understanding for what realistic change looks like in addressing systematic change within the force? Well, I mean, <clears throat> I'll be quite blunt. I don't think police are capable of um, correcting themselves. Um, there needs to be independent oversight. And we saw that with the McPherson report and the recommendations. Progress was actually monitored through the Stephen Lawrence steering group. And that was chaired by Jack Straw. And it had Neville and Doreen Lawrence and other chief constables and heads of department even myself as chair of the, the National Black Police Association, and they would measure progress because what gets measured gets done. And if you know you're going to get a phone call or you're going to be held to account for a lack of progress, then people invariably will focus on it and make changes and innovation and sustainable change. But once you take the pressure off them, they will go back to trait. And that's what we saw with the McPherson inquiry. First 10 years of the recommendations, it had the political will, it had the independent oversight of the uh, Stephen Lawrence steering group, and we saw progress. We even saw the percentage of, of African, Caribbean, and Asian people in the organization move from 2% to 12%, and that, that, that's in the Met. So we saw real exponential change, culture change, improvement in service delivery to the public, especially um, minority communities. But after we got the change in government in 2010, which is similar um, party group now, we saw a disconnect. We saw the independent oversight being lost. We saw the recommendations being nullified. Nothing was being monitored. And we saw things have gone backwards. So it was like 10 steps forwards, 10 steps back. Austerity didn't help. We saw Brexit come in in 2016 and that emboldened people with racist tendencies in the public. And we saw that in the police because the police are a reflection of the public. We saw emboldened officers being extremely heavy handed with, uh, with people and they think they could get away with it. They felt untouchable. And these elements um, as really 
push race equality and diversity and inclusion off the agenda. Um, in fact, it's been kicked out the boardroom. It's not really discussed in the same way as the independent oversight. So it shows to me that the police are not capable of, of correcting themselves. They need political will, they need independent oversight um, and, and need to be held to account because they'll go back to trade because the, the Met is 200 years old in seven years, no, eight years time. In 1829, the Met was formed and it was made for the haves, protect the haves from the have nots. So they, they, the construct is for the privileged uh, and they see minority groups as the less privileged. So that's, that's why things operate and they go back to trait. Everything they, and that's why we have this cyclic conversation about change and you get a certain amount of change and it goes back to trait. If you take the pressure off the pedal, it goes back to where it was and then we start talking about it over again. So until we get the political will for sustainable and irreversible change, people, and, and take it away from police, because having been in it for 30 years, they're not capable of monitoring themselves because it's a success-driven can-do organization and they mark their own homework as they are now. This is where we're in the position we're in. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Danielle Campbell. What advice would you give to young people who are considering joining the force but are conflicted about the systemic racism and issues, um, specifically dealing with officers who have clear biases? Well, those with clear biases should not go in the organisation in the first place. Um, I'm, I'm glad to see that certain force areas are saying that a criteria to join the police is to do a, a police degree because it's professionalising those officers. And if you have to buy into that before you join, then it will filter out those who are into a power trip because unfortunately a lot of officers, it's, it's a power trip for them. They're not really police servants because oh, we're, we're actually public servants. We're, we're supposed to be a police service. We serve the needs of the community. And so we're accountable. And that, that contract has been from the beginning, 1829, when Sir Robert Peel set up the Met, he said the police are the public and the public are the police. That's a contract. So that means you've got to work with the community. That means you can't arrest your way out of a problem or stop and search your way out of the problem. You've got to work with the public especially the target group of people that needs to turn things around, like the violence on the streets, like the drug dealing, like the county lines, the violence. We saw what's happened to Sasha Wilson um, two days ago, being shot in the head, whether it's an intentional act or not. But how many, how many people are going to come forward and say, yeah, we know who did it and we know why they did it and we're going to make a statement go on ID parade and they're going to go to court. Well, that's going to be a tough one because one, they're not connected with the police because they feel disconnected. They feel over-policed and, and underprotected. Now I'm not condoning that, but it's understandable if your day-to-day -day service delivery and your interaction with police turns them off and they won't report crimes to them. You know, Voyage, we talk about these issues for the last 20 years and it's, it is getting worse. And the look and feel of policing for a lot of young people is as if during their parents' day. And, and, and I do get a sense that the look and feel of policing reminds me of pre-McPherson era, which is 20 odd years ago. So for me, police are the last people to correct themselves. Uh, and they, the, the, the politicians need to recognise that. And we're going to have this cycle, cyclic environment or conversation that's not going to really make the changes we all want to see. Thank you. Um, before I pass it back to Dion, um, I'm just going to let one of our young people, Faye, ask his question. Faye? Okay. So we might have to come back to Faye then. All right, so I'll pass it back to Dion. Okay, so next we're gonna have a creative piece from Salon. 
Um, hi guys, I'm Salon. Um, I'm an actor, dancer, director and producer. Um, I just want to say from watching Small Acts, I'm a very, um, when it comes to my, my culture, my background, I'm very passionate about what's going on. And from watching Small Acts and watching your story, I just kept thinking that you're constantly fighting something, whether that's the police, uh, your family's opinions, you're constantly against someone or something. Um, so I created a dance piece uh, to show. Um, I'm going to share my screen so that you guys can watch it. I hope you kind of get that from what I've created. So enjoy. We're no closer to really getting to the heart of the problem. Why is violence so endemic in our youth culture? We can't arrest ourselves out of this problem. So I can hear about stop and search and surcharges. In fact, that can create fear and alienation more for the target group that we're trying to support. So that's, for me, not the way to do it. I've been walking with my face turned to the sun. Weight on my shoulders, a bullet in my gun. Oh, I got eyes in the back of my head. Just in case I have to run I do what I can when I can While I can for my people While the clouds roll back And the stars fill the night That's when I'm gonna stand up Take my people with me Together And you know what gets me? They got 50 billion for Brexit, but they haven't got 0.01% for knife crime. Now that doesn't make sense to me. Early in the morning, before the sun begins to shine, we're gonna start moving towards that separation. Salvation, and I'll fight with the strength that I got until I die. So I'm gonna stand up, take my people with me. I don't hear anyone talking about um, crime in our streets. I don't hear anyone talking about violence. I don't hear anyone really saying, "Well, listen, we need to come together, all part." Parliamentary Commission and various other organisations and we are going to make sure that we do this whether the politicians want to get involved or not.
we've got to engage with the target group, not alienate them. We've got to advocate for them. I do that right now in East London. It's called um, Spark to Life. And we're working with young people every single day. And what they need is someone to support them so that they don't go back to the same peer group, they don't go back to the same area, they don't go back to the same type of behaviour. You've got to break that pattern of behaviour and develop positive peer-to-peer -peer mentoring. Young people have the answers. They can support each other and that's what we need to do. I'm, I'm a great believer of, um, if you say you love me, show, you, show me you love me. Um, that's one of the pieces to go. Um, um, oh my gosh! I, listen, you, you guys are going to reduce me to tears, and it's not a pretty <laughs> sight. Seeing an old man cry is not a pretty sight. So um, you guys better ease off me for a bit because <laughs> this is powerful stuff. Um, Honestly, I don't remember <laughs> saying all that. <laughs> well, that, 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 that's uh, a few years back. Um, yeah, no, it was really powerful um, watching it. I do because um, there is a lot of knife crime in my area. So hearing you speak about it like that, um, and because I do a lot of circus stuff, such as knife juggling and et cetera, et cetera, I've worked to implement it and merge it with what you said um, and it inspired me to create this. So thank you. Well, yeah. yeah. I must admit, you know, sometimes when you say things, and I'm a bit like a broken record, really, because uh, I remember watching my, my interviews 20 years ago. I'm banging on about the same things. Um, and sometimes it can be a bit disappointing that you, you see change and you know you want it to, to, to be sustainable and, you, you, and things don't move on. And, and it, but you can't be discouraged because, in, in all honesty, um, Young people like your, yourselves encourage me because um, I don't want my grandchildren to go through the same injustices my children's generation have gone through, my generation has gone through, my parents' generation. They came through in a wind rush in the 50s. You know, I, I, I don't want them to, their plight, their pain to continue into future generations. So, um, but, you know, it, it, it's really inspiring just just to see how you've um, really adopted um, small acts and what it's saying and yeah. um, you know my story um, it's, um, yeah it means a lot words, so words thank, you. thank you very much that was really powerful thank you yeah that was amazing like so good um, so we're going to move on we've got a couple more questions um, so you're not going to make me cry though I, 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 I'm going to bring my hanky <laughs> Yeah, we have a break. You can just answer some questions and okay, then okay. we have two more creative pieces. Um, so, Faye, am I saying your name right? Yeah, you are. So apologies for earlier uh, technical difficulties, um, but here now. Um, yeah, that was a great performance, I have to say so. Uh, Karate Kid 20, as I said. Um, what I wanted to uh, um, um, ask Leroy was, that there was a, a, a report that came out about uh, Britain um, not um, being uh, institutionally racist or uh, there's been sort of a decrease in institutional racism uh, in, 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 in Britain, which obviously ruffled a few feathers um, here and there. Uh, my question to you is, if you were to be a sort of police uh, commissioner and do a, a commissioner report into uh, the sort of um, police, what would you, um, and the title of the report was, the police is no longer, uh, has no, um, no longer has institutional racism. What would you um, be expecting to see in the result of that report? Well, as far as I'm concerned, institutional racism is alive and well, because the evidence we submitted in 1998 at the Mifflius inquiry is exactly the same the internal um, culture, um, the plight of black officers, the high um, risk of being subject to misconduct, the, 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 the fact that they're not going through the ranks, um, it, it's still the same. Uh, they tried to stop me from going for superintendent. When I was chief inspector and I was chair of the Black Police Association, someone's telling me I'm not up for 
the next step. Well, I proved them wrong. But, you know, it could have a massive impact about your confidence if you're not, you know, clear on what you can do and your capabilities and your purpose. Um, and the same things in, in external purposes, you know, stop and search and all the other things I've already spoken about. Um, so as far as I'm concerned, institutional racism is alive and well. You know, the, the, the gangs matrix, 80% of people on the gangs matrix are black. Well, we're the white gangs then. Um, um, some percent of people tasered are black. Why, why don't white people get tasered if they're so quick, quick to the draw? Um, it, it, it just goes on. The DNA database, majority of people on that, black. Um, so it, it, it shows to me that, as I said, it's 10 steps forward, 10 steps back. And I, I, I spoke about political will, but it seems like this, this government is hell bent on changing the narrative like institutional racism doesn't exist. Well, we know it does. So don't try and undermine people's intelligence by saying it does, doesn't exist. Um, to, to say that slavery had some positives, um, the mass transfer of people, treating them like commodities to the tune of 12 plus million and enslaving them, stripping them of their identity the language, the names, and you're telling me that had positives, um, and all these sort of things in that report. But I'm not surprised by it because I've known Tony Sewell for over 20 years, and I knew his um, his view on institutional racism and the fact that these things don't impact on people going getting through. Well, I, I know from the Sus Law days that if you're in the wrong place at the wrong time and you, had to, you got ar arrested by the Thorpe police and they put you before the court and you get a custodial a sentence, your life choices are gone. And, that, and, that, and I saw that happen on numerous occasions. And that's why they repealed the SUS law in uh, 1984 and brought in the Police and Criminal Evidence Act. Even that's not perfect, it, it's still being misused. Uh, with racial profiling and stop and search, um, section one of, of PACE. So all these things are alive and well. And for anyone to write a report rubbishing those systemic failures and trying to change the narrative in a whitewash, well, for me, he is not fit to even head a commission, much less come up with a a report that's not worth the paper it's written on. Um, but I'm not surprised because, as I said, I knew his views on these things and I, would, and I knew he would get a group of people that thought like him um, or had the same sort of thinking. And um, it, it's so disappointing that how people who should be part of the solution are part of the problem. Um, fortunately, it's part of the human condition people put their own personal agenda before the greater good and there lies a lot of our issues. I, I would like to think that the, the pushback and, and um, the real critical mass of people saying, no, we were not going to put up to that. We're not going to put up with that report. The petitions, I even signed one yesterday saying not allowing that report to be implemented and it has to be retracted and for it to be debated in parliament, all these things. And I, I just hope we, we're gonna get the opportunity for our black MPs like David Lammy, Diane Abbott, et cetera, to really talk, push this through um, and, and get back the, the lost time uh, we've had to go through with this government over the last 10 years. Now, I'm not trying to make it a political argument, but just go and buy the evidence because I. Even as a scientist, I have to go by the evidence. As a cop, go by the evidence. And it's clear to me that this approach of this government will only end in tragedy for some people if they don't turn this around. Um, I'm not into riots. Um, I'm not gonna condone violence or any form of criminality. 
but don't be surprised if there's an uprising. Um, and if you look back in history, most of the uprisings occur when the Tory government are in power. Um, you've got to think about that. The Brixton riots um, in 40 years ago, the Tottenham riots 10 years ago. So something to think about. Thank you. Thank you. So the next question is from, it's anonymous, um, but I'm going to read it. One sec, give me a moment. Sorry, I've just got to find it. Okay, so what do you think about the idea of people advocating for defrauding the police? Can you give a brief history on the police? institution because some claim it was only established to control the populace and how do you marry the humanity of people of color amid a volatile culture but also the necessity of police culture a really lot there isn't it <laughs> um well i've already said that um the the met was constructed in 1829 to protect the haves from the have-nots mm -hmm. so i think i've already answered that um, just remind me of the other questions. Um, well, I've got to find it again. <laughs> um, so, sorry. The first one was what do you think about the idea of people advocating for defrauding the police? You mean defunding the police? Defunding the police? Yeah, that's something that um, the, in, in America, uh, the Black Lives Matter. I've been talking about and they mentioned it over here. I, I don't think that term is helpful, but I do believe a lot of what they're talking about is similar to the public health approach we've been talking about over here, where you actually deploy your assets according to the skills they've got. So don't start um, allocating or deploying police officers to deal with mental health cases or people suffer from drug mm -hmm. psychosis because they, Officers are trained, um, a lot, well, a lot of officers are trained to de-escalate, but invariably they de-escalate. Um, very rarely they de-escalate. They actually es escalate things when they turn up. They, they, they seem to increase the heat when they should be trying to calm things down. Um, a lot of the times they go in hard before they actually ascertain what's going on. Now, sometimes you need to go in hard and, and, and control that person because they... The, the actual risk they pose to the public and the officers. So they need to go in hard, but sometimes they're overzealous, especially if it's like a foot chase, like I said, Rashan Charles or uh, a vehicle chase, they get so pumped up. When they arrive, it takes them a long time to calm down. So de-escalation is something that we need to bring in. And, that, and that's the trauma informed approach so you don't see people in just a linear process. It's a multifaceted. Sometimes that person needs help as a patient, not as a, to be thrown in jail at the station. So that sort of public health approach is something I worked on through a, an all parliamentary commission on youth violence between 2016 and 2020. And we came out with uh, our reports, an interim report in 2018 and then in 2020, advocating these issues. We even encourage the mayor to develop the violence reduction unit, which we observed doing some great stuff in Glasgow. And now we've got them all across the country. So they, they, they you know, we, we know we can put the pressure on politicians to make changes, but like everything, um, it, it's, as I said, it's 10 steps forward, 10 steps back. Uh, so the, the public health approach, I believe is the way in which we can um, have an asset approach to the skills of the officers or skills of um, the public services. So you may have a triage approach, i.e. police officers with paramedics, social workers. So they're dealing with um, people according to their need and not just one size fits all. You know, oh, that's someone's a risk. Put on the cuffs, throw them in a van, take them to court or take them to the station. And sometimes people need to go to a place of safety 
um, and it's not a police station. So all of these things, I believe the public health approach and trauma-informed policing is the way forward. Uh, what was the other question? Um, how do you marry the humanity of people of colour amid a volatile culture, but also the necessity of police structure? Uh, I'm not quite sure what they mean. Are they talking about a reflective organisation, how you get into that? Is that I what? think it's saying, like, how do you marry, like, bringing black people together with such a volatile um, culture and also, like, adding on... Sorry, let me just read it again. Adding on, um, like, the need of the police at the same time. Does that okay. make sense? Okay, well, I mean... As, as I said, police are, are a service. They're supposed to serve the needs of the community. So they have to recognise that they're part of that partnership. Um, I know it's difficult to, for some people to have, be in the same space as police. Um, I know because of their experiences or other people's experiences. But we were able to um, turn that around with how we encourage young people to be part of our Young Leaders for Safer Cities process through Voyage Youth. And um, some young people who would never admit to being in the same space as police would want to learn from them um, and debate things quite heatedly with them. Um, so it can be done. Um, I, I don't think it's something that we can take for granted and say, oh, it'll never happen because we've done it in Voyage. But it, it takes a, a lot of prepping for people to say, listen, let, let's have a discussion with police and understand that um, there needs to be a mutual exchange of ideas. Um, and, and that's where, I, as I was saying in that, that caption that um, Cell did, uh, the dance routine, there needs to be a, a real understanding of dialogue with the target group and given the assets to ensure that happens. Because as I said, they spent 50 billion pound on Brexit and not in 0.01% on knife crime. Mm. Um, and, and that's, the priorities are all wrong. So there, there needs to be a change of thinking and, and, and approach. And, and also the narrative, you know, you, you can change the look and feel of police by just how you talk about what you're gonna do as a police officer. If the commissioner, Chrisetta Dick, I know her well, if she would make it clear that, yep, yeah, all right, institutional racism is an issue, but we are willing to work at it. And we have statement of intent. We have the ethical leadership. We're gonna bring back citizen focused policing. We're gonna bring in the public health approach. All of these things would change the look and feel of it. It would have a ripple effect across the organization and, and, and reduce this sort of macho, testosterone driven officers going around think they could do whatever they want and believe they're um, untouchable. So it can be done, but it yeah. means holding the commissioner to account, whether it's the mayor or the home secretary, it, it can be done, but it needs that political will. And um, I, I, I believe that that would encourage people to have that conversation with officers once they know they're being held to account once they know that they really want to work with people and, and reconnect, because as I said, there's been this disconnect for so long, um, but we live in hope. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, so we're gonna pass on to Candice. I believe you're asking a question on behalf of someone else. Yeah, yeah. Hi. Um... I hope everyone is doing well. Um, so, you, uh, my question is about your relationship with your dad. Uh -huh. So, um, is your relationship with your dad similar to how it was painted in small acts? And how did you navigate that? Um, I would say it was very accurate. Uh, I think the emotional truth was very, very... I don't know how Steve really replicated it um, so well um, because um, my father passed away in 2002. So he wasn't able to <laughs> speak to him direct. And um, yeah, he died a year after my mum 
in 2001. So, but they enacted both of them so well, um, maybe because uh, Steve picked up from myself and my sister. Uh, my sister was also featured in the film and, and my wife, Gretel, uh, they were really close to my parents. So they, they were able to really show that emotional truth. Um, my, 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 my father, my, it, it, it wasn't as volatile. My, my, my dad wasn't um, into swearing like that. <laughs> not, not, not in public. He wouldn't swear at other people. He had his moments. He wasn't perfect, but he, 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 had a, he wouldn't swear at other people like he did with Jesse Stevens and, and stuff like that. Um, but he was a passionate man and um, he knew right from wrong and he, he, he worked very hard and to, to have a positive family life. So, and he always wanted the best for me and my sister. So if he saw that we weren't doing the best, we weren't working hard at school or we were making the wrong sort of choices, he, he'd be on us like a rash, you know, and, because he loved us and he, and he didn't want to um, let us sort of make the wrong choices, which could be life-changing. Um, so yeah, it was very ac accurate. And um, I actually commended um, not only John, John Boyega for, for, for his acting um, me, <laughs> but also Steve Toussaint who played my dad. And, um, you know, I, I, and also um, all the other actors, even uh, little Nathan who played little Leroy. <laughs> I thought that would, um, he, 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 he did really well. In fact, because of little Nathan, I started to watch Bridgerton. I don't know if you watch Bridgerton because Nathan was the little boy who would run around with the, the little newsletters that had all the scandal on it. Um, so yeah, it was because uh, of it, young Nathan, I, um, um, yeah, I started to watch it. But I, I think in all honesty, um, it'd be great to meet them. Uh, I, I haven't actually had a chance to meet them since all the, um, well, other than being on set, because COVID has been in place since then. Um, but I, I would like to uh, really thank them personally because they did a really great job. And Steve McQueen is an amazing guy. Um, I, I just cannot thank him enough. He did say to me, um, Leroy, has your life changed? He asked me a question. He, yeah, it was after um, Small Acts. It was just before Christmas and we were on this, um, this um, Zoom call together. And uh, yeah, it was early December. And he said, has your life changed? I said, actually it has because certain conversations I'm having, certain experiences. Um, and that conversation really came to mind when I was just watching Sal's dance. Um, I, I've never had someone interact dance with footage of me saying things. That's really life-changing. That, that's made an old man feel very happy. Um, I can safely go to my grave and say I've experienced something quite unique, quite original. And um, yeah, so, I mean, he, st that's what Steve does. He, he actually changes people's lives, whether the, the, the roles they're playing or, or part of the crew um, or even the people he uses to be extras. Um, yeah, he, he is um, a change agent. Um, and uh, he, for me, it's beyond my life, wildest dreams being part of Small Axe. And uh, Hopefully, on the 6th of June, uh, we'll get some more BAFTAs. We had some yesterday. That was the sort of uh, cast, sorry, the crew type awards, but the um, in front of camera type awards will be on the 6th of June. So you know, hope we, we, we hope for the best. But the, all, all the other um, series, uh, the, all the, the other episodes are absolutely amazing. Um, Mangrove, Lover's Rock. Um, I know it wasn't everyone's taste, but they, they all were saying different things and um, getting people to talk about these issues was, was, was part of that. Even education, which was about the, the uh, education system, the subnormal education system. Um, and there was another show on that even last week, um, which Steve inspired. He was executive producer. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, and even the one on Alex Wheatle, um, amazing guy. So 
yeah, just just really pleased to be around when uh, and being part of it at a time where you know with Black Lives Matter and and the George Floyd um, legacy, it, it's 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 good, and I really think it's a really important time to really put the pressure on those in authority to make the changes we want to see. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, we have one more question and then we're going to have two more quote pieces and then we'll be finished. <laughs> um, okay, so the next question is from Junior and it says, um, how were you able to handle the backlash from your family or your friends um, from your decision to join the force? Well, it wasn't easy because, you know, especially my, pa my parents, they wanted me to carry on with my science, my dad especially. Um, my mother was always supportive. Um, Grandpa, my wife, was always supportive. Um, my dad, obviously, because of what happened to him being beaten up. And he had, to, you know, he showed real wisdom and, and support. And, and I must admit, um, you know, the, the scene where he takes me to Hendon and Al Green is playing and there's this embrace. Uh, I can't see my dad doing that to me. <laughs> he did drive me to Hendon, actually, when I didn't think he was going to do that. Uh, we had a good chat in the car, and then I left without the L green and without the, the hug. Um, I've got a handshake out of him, which is great. But, it, it, you know, he really showed wisdom because um, it was a double whammy for him, me not pursuing my science purpose, and then I'm joining the ranks of the officers that beat him up. He had a lot to deal with. But, you know, he gave me that validation. Um, 17 years later, when I got the MBE um, and I was going to Buckingham Palace, and as you got the main stairs and the recipients go one stairwell and the guests go the other way, uh, I remember just as we were walking up the stairs, my dad said, well, um, I think you did the right thing after all. And that meant so much to me because um, it was the real first time he said, yeah, you made the right decision, um, even though he wasn't against me, but he, he was, he never really, you know, made, made, made his thinking known uh, and, you know, and within two years he was dead. Um, as I said, he passed away in 2002 and, uh, and, and my mother in 2001. So um, I was so glad I accepted it and be, for them, I dedicate the MBE for, to my parents because they, 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 they came over in a boat in the early 50s and, so, and then within 50 years, they're in Buckingham Palace. So from the boat to Buckingham Palace, it's pretty um, interesting journey they've gone through because when they came over in the 50s, early 50s, there was this issue about no Irish, no blacks, no dogs. They couldn't get a place to sleep, couldn't get a loan to get a job or get an accommodation. They couldn't even get an interview for a job. Um, it was amazing they, they can get through that. And um, so I'm glad I accepted it, even if it's for the fact that my dad gave me that validation, which I, I'm glad he didn't take, to, take with him to the grave. He actually shared it with me before then. So uh, yeah, it was uh, really excellent. Thank you. That's so nice. Um, yeah, so now we're going to move on to a creative piece from Georgia slash Chelsea, it says on my plan. <laughs> okay. Hello, good, good evening, evening everyone. everyone. Hi. Hi, everyone. Hi there. Lovely to be here with you. Thank you so much. This is really exciting. Um, yeah, we've had such a good night so far. Absolutely, listening to everyone, it's been it's been a pleasure. It's been a real treat this evening. <laughs> um, so normally, uh, my sister and I we perform our poetry together, but um, today we've done two separate poems, um, just short little ditties, um, and we're going to perform them for you now. <coughs> Father, father, he lived a life close to yours. We were given small doses of those confrontations and it exhausts to know that they never got tired of weighing down your soul. Your first line of defense is intellect, 
so they can't rubber neck you. My dad too, an old fashioned West Indies, planned your life as an extension of his, come from foreign to do the forensic and you detected the biggest crime, a collage of twisted minds. So show me a motion to move towards better times. So you just stepped out on the beat, sharper, darker and looked after and the world pumped you for answers. Will you remain on nodding terms with the person you used to be or take up space in the human race for global unity? That's mine. And yeah, Chelsea's. And mine is entitled The Call. From the West Indies to London, education is the pursuit, but the call it came full of terror and pain, summoning its next recruit. Officer Leroy Logan, here to protect and serve, driven by community and the merits you deserve. The daily taunts from the police force are exhausting. The enemy stay, enemy stay stiff like tree. But if you are a big, big tree, we are a small ax, ready to cut you down, to cut you down. So go there, Leroy, a toast to you. Your story will be told again of how you answered your calling for the future of Black British men. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Wow. Amazing. <laughs> oh, wow. I, I, I'm going to watch this all again, and, and I'm going to sit on my own with a nice glass of red wine and bawl my eyes out. <laughs> Oh, thank you. This, thank you. This, this has been so amazing. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's thank an you. honor. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. I, I must admit, the, 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 I wasn't too sure if the, the, when they were developing the series, they never gave it, gave it a name. And when I heard it was going to be Small Axe from the Bob Marley track, and, and I thought, well, you know, this again showed Steve's is cult cultural richness and wanted to bring in a new narrative with tried and tested narratives like Bob Marley's tracks in it. Um, e even just going back to the picture um, by Xavier uh, and um, the, uh, sorry, Britney's one, Britney's one um, as well, where we, we showed, um, you know some of the brokenness and and the the importance of of using like narrative red, white, and blue, because you know I don't know if you ever when you see the end do you, the boy with the bicycle and the Union Jack do, do you actually see it at the very end? That's where you got the red, white, and blue from. It's from the Union Jack, and and that picture was taken in the seventies by a young book by a photographer. I think it was in Birmingham. It was actually exhibited up there. Uh, of a young boy riding his bike with a Union Jack, which is, I, I, he was a brave young man to be doing that in the 70s um, because certain people might not take it very well while you, you know, riding around with the Union Jack. But it just showed his black Britishness and his, his identity and wanted to make a statement. And for Steve to use that, it's, it's quite amazing. Um, so, yeah, um, I'm sure, it, you know, it's like, microscope with Steve, the more you really zoom in on him, you get this, um, so many different layers to him and, and what he's trying to do. Um, so yeah, I'm definitely going to send this, um, YouTube to him. He's got to watch this. Not for me, for you people. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you, ladies. So I'm just quickly going to pass it now to our final creative piece, which is done by our very own host, Dion. Oh. So I'll let you take the lead, Dion. Thank you. Um, so originally I'm a singer and I was trying to write a song, but I couldn't force it. So I decided to write a poem instead. So I wrote it today, so I'm going to read it off my phone. Um, but I hope you enjoy. For there are words that I can't speak. I am still perceived as weak. In a place where I should belong, I don't, and the reason is unknown. 
My ability to fulfill my role is equal to the one you hold, yet you still can't find it within your heart to smash the mold, tear it apart. That you are white and I am black, but my color is just a fact, yet your interpretation of me is more. Since you are, you are so very sure that I don't deserve to walk this earth, I don't deserve to have this worth, I don't deserve to live in peace, I don't deserve to be released from your hand that holds me tight and strangles my existence. Well, that's not right. You created this distance. I am human and you are too. And try to see this from my point of view, that if everyone who was born white was beaten, killed and withheld from right, would you then see my problem? Would you let me breathe again? Would you understand how I feel? Would you give me time to heal? See, we didn't get an apology or a change of heart, but now we have the air to breathe and maybe that's where we start. But I didn't give up, I strived for more. I put myself in places that I could soar. I can say I'm here today, not because of you, but because of my ancestors who made it through. I'm here today to tell my story and to give hope to those who come after me. So when you are older and you've made it through, you'll pave the way for those who come after you. Not because it was the easy thing to do, but it's part of what made you, you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to hear you sing one time, though, so uh, <laughs> for the next event. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, the, the last um, uh, poems have been really, really um, quite, quite amazing. Uh, my, my, my daughter, uh, she, she works in a Pru. She's a teacher. She's been in a, a Pru teacher for the last 10 years. So um, I'm definitely going to pass on um, your spoken I know her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So she's, she's definitely going to um, see that. Um, it was not only her used to write me poetry, so I've got all, the, all of you people <laughs> write me poetry, which is great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leroy. Is there any kind of final words you want to say to everybody on the call and to the YouTube audience as well before we finish? Well, I, I, I don't know if they're, they're still there, but, um, but I, I've got a WhatsApp group for um, people involved in small acts and, um, you know, been a support for me. Um, so Lee John, um, well, Greg, my wife, uh, I think she's gone on to do something else. Um, but Lee John, um, he's been my best friend. Um, he's my, as they say, a brother from another mother. Um, and I said, his mother, Aunt Jessie, uh, she's still around. She's 93. She's as strong as she's ever been. She actually defies logic. And um, yeah, amazing woman. She still works with the police um, and the community at the young age of 93. Um, so I know Lee has been on the group. I, I sent them the link and they've been, uh, been extolling your virtues and your skills and abilities so well done i just want to sort of name check them george luke um who's um my ghostwriter for the book um just want to name check him he, he's uh, uh we, we complimented each other very well he's so different to me and uh yeah i just want to thank him charlie allen who, who did um the costumes uh, certain costumes for small acts so he, he dressed up john um quite 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 amazing uh some of the costumes um that you, you would have thought i mean that the, the detail in which um steve went to ensure people were wearing the same sort of clothes it was it's quite amazing um so I, I and i just want to say um thank you to you for 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 putting on um this event i i, I didn't know what to expect um I think it was Cherie when she took me in the green room and told me, well, this is what you're going to expect. And this is what you have really? Um, I didn't think two hours would have flown by so quickly. Um, so no, I, I, I'm, I'm just been blown away. Um, just keep up the great work you're doing. Um, I, and two things I want to plug, um, well, three things. Um, I'm, if, if you want to be in touch with me, I've got my website, LeroyLogan.com. Um, and, my management company, TGRG, the girl with the red glasses, um, Juanita, 
um, she, she, she's um, the person that sort of makes sure I turn up and don't talk nonsense and look the part, that sort of stuff. Um, so I just want to um, name check um, TGRG, I'm a manager. Um, and as I said, there's loads of stuff on the website, what I'm doing. And uh, I want to make sure this feature's on there as well. This has to go on my website. Um, so if there's any copyright stuff, let's talk about it. Let's go on my website. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I just want to say that uh, on, on the website as well, that I'm, I'm doing a, a project called Capturing Voices and uh, wanting to work with um, young people to know how the trauma they experience from police tactics, whether it's stop and search or section 60s or any sort of reaction with the police, um, because I think we need to humanize the trauma so that they understand the impact they're having. So I'm doing that with um, some academics. Um, so I, I'm, I'm hoping that that will, we've already started to collect data. Um, so if you know anyone who believes that they, they want to um, share their experience so that we can feed back to the police to say, well, it, 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 you won't be um, um, outed in any way. It'd be totally confidential. So, we, but the, the qualitative analysis needs people to, to share their experience and not just in London, but outside London as well. Um, so capturing voices, please, uh, again, it's on the website. Um, and also um, since small acts, I haven't been sort of sitting down thinking, well, that's great. Even though the, the small acts train is still going on with, the, with various awards, the Golden Globe and, and, and now the BAFTAs, um, and various other things in between. But um, I, I've been um, looking at doing a children's book and um, it, it, it is going to be multi-layered to help with the transition from primary to secondary school. Um, so I, I'm, I'm formulating my ideas around that. And also um, looking at doing a, a film. Um, following up, if I had a penny for every single time, someone said, what happened afterwards? Um, I said, well, read the book then. I mean, no, but you know, you do a film as well. So I, I'm trying to, uh, I'm working with some script writers as we speak. Um, and I, you know, I'd love um, you all to be part of that sort of writing process. Um, it'd be really good. So um, you might see more of me. You might think, oh God, I'm getting fed up with this guy, but you know. Um, but no, it'd be really great. Uh, I think the collaboration um, is really possible. And um, I know um, my script writers, Jonathan and Adam would love to meet you all. Um, you know, even if it's just virtually, we, we, could, we could have, um, um, we could definitely help with the treatment we're, we're drawing up. And, and of course, um, the writer's room, that is something if, if there are, people who, who would like to have an input, please feed it through um, my, my management team, or, or you can just, um, if you want to email, um, if you email team LL, um, so team and my initials LL at leewarlogan.com, um, please just, just please um, share your ideas with us. It'd be great. Um, also, final, 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 uh, I'm on Twitter. Leroy Logan triple nine. Uh, you see, I'm still institutionalized. I've got 999 on my Twitter handle. My children always say, why don't you get rid of that? But, you know, <laughs> it's a, please don't report crimes on my Twitter page. I am not the police anymore. <laughs> um, uh, I'm on Insta, Leroy Logan double nine. Um, I missed the nine somewhere, but anyway. It, it, so please um, you know, get in touch through that. LinkedIn, if you're um, on that as well. So I'm about, I'm not going anywhere. As I said, the work continues, the struggle continues. And of course, you know, when it comes to iconic days like this with George Floyd, and, you know, we, we, we really want to see the Black Lives Movement uh, move on and we wish Sasha the best. Uh, hopefully she'll get through uh, and have a full recovery. And, um, you know, I, I, I wish you all well. Um, and it's been a, an amazing experience. And uh, I'm, I'm definitely going to be watching this several times, like I did with Small Axe and Red, White and Blue. 
Thank you so much, Leroy. I know so many people in this call, in this chat, are saying yes to co collaborating, um, working with you, meeting you again. Um, so please, we'll definitely keep in contact. Um, and I've sent it across to the, to the rest of the group. So thank you so much to everybody who attended. Thank you so much to everybody on the call. Thank you to the people in the YouTube. Um, and also thank you so much to Mala, to Jade, to Amara, to Alicia, to Kieran, for being the amazing people they are and who without them, this would never be possible. So thank you guys so much for making this happen. Um, thank you to my, to my uh, co-host Dion as well. Thank you so much for the amazing work that you do with our young people anyway, and then also coming on this with me. So um, thank you for coming. Hope to see you guys again soon. Please again watch this on YouTube, MYM, sorry, MYM, <laughs> Billion Youth Media. You can find Fully Focus at uh, UK Fully Focus. Um, you can find Leap at Leap underscore CC, and you can find the Rise Collective UK on Instagram and Twitter and LinkedIn if you want to go. So, Dion. Sorry, guys. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, thank, thank you, Lou Rowe, um, for coming here today, for answering our questions and listening to our responses. Um, we really appreciate it. It wouldn't be an event without you and your life and your story. Um, so we really appreciate um, you, your time and you coming here today. Um, are we finished with the live now? No. Probably shouldn't have said that then.